Hey folks, I'm back. As you can see, I'm in a different location. I'm in my brother's home. So at my brother's house, the internet connection is not the best. We buffer real badly here. So pray that the Lord Jesus Christ and his infinite love, mercy and compassion will bless this session, bless us and fill us with the spirit and bless the internet connection from buffering badly. So I'm in a different location. The internet here is not the best, but I decided to do another session because I had some free time. It's a Monday. It's just a manic Monday. And I had the choice of either going to Barnes and Nobles and doing some more research for some articles or go see a movie or do another session. So I chose to do another session, hoping the spirit will use me to glorify Jesus and bless you in Jesus name. Right? So and do pray guys. God has helped me tremendously in my weight he's given me the grace that over these two years to lose a lot of weight keep it off please pray that jesus in his mercy will continue to help me to keep this weight off never gain it and lose more weight because i still haven't reached my goal and i'm doing it as slowly as possible right and lose it slowly and keep it off by the power of jesus and that he'll give me victory over my flesh and all my weaknesses right so please pray for me well daryl you know what happens it's uh at times you know, I'm, I don't have anything to do. I'm here all by myself, so I need to occupy the time, right? When you when you have family, when you have children you're surrounded with, they take up your time. But when you're all alone and you don't have your children, you have to do all you can to burn up any free time you may have because one of the worst things is idleness because that's when Satan comes and tries to whisper in your ear and get you to think about your circumstances and discourage you, right? Isn't there a saying that says idleness is Satan's playtime, right? So believe me, when I had my kids, I had the world. But, you know, God is good. The day will come. The day will come. Jesus Christ will transform this world, and he's going to make – this world, the world of perfect righteousness, perfect peace, love, and joy. No more evil, no more sin, no more wickedness, no more pain, no more misery, no more death, no more disease. But until that world comes, we all have to bear our crosses, no matter how big or small, by the power of the Holy Spirit and endure for the glory of Jesus, right? Because don't forget, folks. Every day away from your children is a day lost because kids grow up pretty fast. And all this time away from my daughters, they're growing up real fast, and I'm being robbed of seeing that. But you know what? The day will come. My God, our God, our Lord, our love, our life, Jesus Christ, will transform our bodies and transform our minds and our hearts and our souls and our wills to become morally incorruptible and physically indestructible. And then we can enjoy each other forever and ever. No more corrupt systems, no more corrupt judges and lawyers, no more corrupt politicians, no more hatred and gossip and slander and envy and malice. That will be all gone. May that day come sooner than later in Jesus' name, right? So pray for the internet connection. I want to finish what I began on whether saying, okay, saying, Saying, huh? Cain is the physical son of Satan. So, Father, we love you. We don't love you the way we should. We love you imperfectly. Have mercy on us and help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to love you as you deserve to be loved. To be in love with Jesus and to love Jesus Christ, your heart become flesh, your son, as he deserves to be loved. And to love your Holy Spirit as he deserves to be loved. Empower us by your spirit, Father. And bless this session as you blessed the previous session. Again, I ask for an anointing from your spirit with such wisdom and knowledge to blow our minds away, to mesmerize, mesmerize us with the depth of your word, how deep your word is. Because the Bible is your word. It's your voice and you are God. Grant me wisdom and knowledge from your spirit to unpack the depth of scripture and to bless your people. Bless them, Father. They're here to hear your word, not me. Bless them, bless me, clothe us with your spirit, seal us by your spirit, cover us with the blood of Jesus and our loved ones. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus, seal them by your spirit, Father. And please arise for our defense and save us. And please grant me a miraculous decision, a favorable one this Thursday for your glory. 
and bless the provisions that you've given me. Preserve those provisions to use them to stand on my feet and provide for my children, Father. And bless this session. Anoint my words to speak truth without error and to recall the scriptures, Father. And bless us with clarity of thought and speech. Save us from attacks of the enemy. Bless the inter internet connection, Father. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Abba, please. Lord Jesus, please. Holy Spirit, please. And give me the health I need to do this for as long as you want me to do this. And never let me succumb to my flesh. And grant me the grace to overcome always that we'll conquer our appetites and walk in the Spirit. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Rapha. Yahovah, Rapha. Yahovah, Rapha. All right? Okay, folks, pray for the regular crowd to show up. We, we're getting to close to 200. Have you noticed it? Now I get over 100, like 150. I'm impressed. The day will come we're going to get over 1,000 and then beat David Wood. You know, some people don't get it that David Wood and I and some of the other brothers, we banter back and forth. We take shots at each other because we're brothers in Christ and love each other. And we'll always be brothers by the grace of the Lord. But some people don't get it. They actually think that we really have some animosity and competition. I mean, it's it's like sickening when I see that. Uh, brother, you, you seem like you're a little jealous, like one guy I had to block, right? You, you feel, I don't know, you seem a little jealous of apostate prophet in David Wood. Are you serious? Are you serious? Right. I hope people listening to this will understand. Let me repeat. By the grace of Jesus, David Wood is my brother for life. Though he's a white dictator, I love him for the sake of the Lord. And he's one of the greatest weapons that God has raised up in the 21st century against Islam and atheism. And I thank the Lord for him and that the Lord has counted me worthy to be his partner. Same thing with Anthony Rogers and others, right? So please stop. Posting nonsense, saying to me, "Oh, what's going on between you and Dave Wood, man? I think that I'm an. Oh no, I, I thought you're brothers, man. How can you just turn against each other? You shattered my heart. My heart shattered. Can you imagine if I were to do comedy and do these impersonations? I'd be much more hilarious and more rich than Jim Carrey. You broke my heart, Sam. I thought you were my hero." Did you ever know that you're my hero? So anyway, despite the fact that David Wood is one ugly white boy and that he is a dictator, a tyrant, right? Still love him, right? And even though, right, he's jealous of me and envious of me, he still has no choice but to praise me. And you've heard him on his channel even say, that in his estimation, and I pray I never believe that, he believes I'm the greatest Christian apologist against Islam in 1,400 years. I want to correct him. In 1,200 years, not 14. Just kidding. <laughs> Did you ever know that you're my hero? Fine, hi. We are the men. We are the children. We are the one who make a brighter day, so let's not give up. Now, people dying. All right. Are we ready to continue where I left off? Halal Hogan's going to make an appearance in a minute. Or before we do that, I wanted to answer a question someone asked me in the comment section. You have to go back and listen to the first part of this session. Is Cain the physical son? Of Satan. Okay. In time when I learn how to do it, Psalms. I haven't learned the technology enough to do that. You were going to sneeze. Oh, really, Sai Christian? What a hater, bro. Anyway, listen. Someone asked me because according to the serpent seed theory, as articulated, as articulated by Pastor Arnold Murray of the Shepherd's Chapel, because Shepherd's Chapel, because he's the most famous advocate of this position. Uh, depends on why you want to email email me, Steve. If you're going to email me your comments and fifty thousand word emails. Don't waste my time. I don't. I won't read it. Right? You're laughing, right, Rachel? Okay. Let's go back to the issue. Let's focus. I just started now. Remember, it's going to buffer, so pray. It's not the best connection. Okay. Let's let's focus. 
right? Let's focus. Okay. If you go back to the first session I did earlier, you'll see that I unpacked what this position entailed. And the most famous advocate of this position, at least as far as I know, was Pastor Arnold Murray of the Shepherd's Chapel. He passed on. His son has taken over, Dennis Murray. Okay, now, he believed there are two acts of <clears throat> creation in respect to men, that God created two different groups of humans, one on the sixth day, one on the eighth day. Are you guys ready? One on the sixth day and one on the eighth day. Are you guys ready to go into the meat so we can unpack this? Okay. He believed that on the sixth day, the races of human beings were created in the image of God, all races, right? But then he believed that after God rested on the seventh day, he interrupted his rest temporarily to create one human couple, Adam and Eve, on the eighth day for the Garden of Eden. So he believes the creation of Adam and Eve, that creative act, is separate from God creating the human races on the sixth day. Okay? That's what he believed. Did you know I recently heard Kent Hoven in passing articulate a similar position? Now, you guys, you guys may want to confirm it, contact him and ask him. But he was on, I don't know if it was a live stream, but I, he was doing a video where he's taking questions. Here he goes. See, didn't I just say? The white dictator. Come on, man. Send me about 800 of your viewers. The great white dope. I mean, hope. There he goes. Hater Wood in the hizzy. I think if you go back, I, I remember hearing him say this. But again, confirm it for me. Contact him or his ministry. I believe that Kent Hoven also believes that Adam and Eve were created specifically on the eighth day, and their creation was separate and different from the six-day creation of the human races. I do believe I heard him say that, right? You get my point? So someone asked me, how do I address that? Is Genesis 1, 26, 27 referring to the same act of creation in Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25, where God creates Adam and Eve, right, in Genesis 2, and that act of creation is the same act of creation mentioned in brief succinctly in Genesis 1. Can I answer that? Are you ready for the answer? Right. Well, Hater Wood is here, uh, Bento Fernandez. Act 17, that's Hater Wood, the world's greatest hater. Let me show you from Scripture that Genesis 1, 26, 27, the creation of Adam, humankind, male and female, includes, encompasses the same creation account of Genesis 2. Let me explain what's happening in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Okay, Genesis 1 is a summation, a summary, a succinct, Description of creation, specifically the creation and filling of the earth. You with me there? I pray you're paying attention and that Holy Spirit will guide me to speak truth without error and anoint my words to make sense to you and pre prevent me from error in Jesus' name. Okay. What you got in Genesis 1 is you have just a summation of the creation of the heavens and the earth, particularly the earth, how God fills it and forms it. And then in Acts 2, what you have is a more detailed account in respect to a particular aspect of that creation, particularly the creation of human beings. You with me there? Just want to make sure you're getting it. And I do repeat myself more than once because I want to make sure by the grace of God's Spirit it's sinking in. So what you have in Genesis 2, a more <clears throat> detailed explanation of the creation of mankind that Genesis 1 briefly touches upon, but that they're referring to the same act of creation. One is simply summing it up, and the other is giving you a more detailed account. Can I prove that? Are you ready for the proof? Are you ready for the proof? Let's look at Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Let's unpack it to get to refute that argument as well. But then I'm going to make some qualifications, right? Genesis 1, 26 to 27, as the Spirit guides this conversation, it won't be too long, right? 
And God said, let us make man. Now, guys, note, if you look at the Hebrew, it says, let us make Adam. The word is Adam. Let us make Adam in our image after our likeness and let them. Did you catch it? Adam is them. Let them. Adam is them. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fall of the earth and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created Adam. The Hebrew word is Adam. And I can give you the interlinear to prove it. Adam. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female, he created them. So notice, Adam is created male and female. The one Adam is more than one person. Guys, focus. Yeah, and hit the like button, please. The one Adam is more than one person. Adam consists of, it's composed of, male and female together. So Adam is male and female. Together they make up Adam. They are to replenish the earth. By procreating their own kind, right? And they are creating the image and likeness of God, right? Adam is male and female together. Two persons together making up the identity of Adam, mankind, humanity. And male and female together are given dominion over physical creation. Male and female are commanded to subdue the earth and replenish it, fill it with human seed. That this is referring to Adam and Eve together. Let's go to Genesis 5, verses 1 to 2. Genesis 5, verses 1 to 2. And then I can open up the QA, I think, because I don't know if there's much more for me to refute, but maybe. Exactly, Irene. Adam equals one man and one woman. Again, keep in mind the Hebrew is Adam all throughout. And I can give you the interlinear if you want proof. You go to BibleHub.com. Check out their interlinear. It provides the Hebrew and English transliteration. So you can confirm it for yourself. Now watch here. This is the book of the generations Adam of Adam, the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, Hebrew is Adam. In the likeness of God made he him. Notice the pronoun singular, him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Did you catch it? Adam is male and female. Male and female are the one Adam. Together, the them are the one Adam. And both of them are called Adam. No, the word Adam growing is a term that can refer to mankind in general, humanity in general, or it can refer to the specific husband of Eve. So growing, it's like the word God. The word God can be used in a general sense for the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, or it can be used specifically as a name of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, grow, growing, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I don't know why your name is Gro Ong. All right. Anyway, I just know you're a sister in the Lord from the Orthodox Church. But man, your name is hard on my tongue, especially on my list. Likewise, the term Adam in Hebrew can either man humanity in general, mankind in general, someone who possesses the nature of Adam, meaning human, or it can refer specifically to the first male, the husband of Eve. Okay. Now to show you that this is referring to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. Let's look at Genesis 5, verse 2 and 3. Genesis 5, verse 2 and 3. Okay. Let's look at it. Genesis 5, verses 2 and 3. Read with me. Male and female created he them, blessed them, and called their name Adam. Their name, both the male and female are called Adam, in the day when they were created. Now notice 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Did you guys catch it or no? Who caught it? Who caught it? Before I move on, I want to see if you caught it. Who caught the implication of verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 5? Let's see who caught it. Notice in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 5, it's referring to Genesis 1, 26 to 27, right? Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2 is referring to Genesis 1, 26 to 27, correct? Follow me. 
Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2 is repeating Genesis 1, 26, 27. But here in Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, we are told in verse 3 that that male and female is Adam, the husband of Eve, because in verse 3, we're now introduced to Adam who fathered Seth from Eve. How do we know it's Adam who fathered Seth from Eve, his wife? Genesis 4.25. Let's look at it. Genesis 4.25. Hold on, Victor. We'll get there. Be patient, friend. Genesis 4, verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again. And in the context in verse, four, verse 1 of chapter 4, that's Eve. He knew his wife again. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she, said she, for God said she, Eve said, for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. So here Eve is saying, God has given me a son, Seth, in the place of Abel whom Cain slew. So here the Adam who fathered Seth is the husband of Eve. So Adam and Eve are the male and female that make up Adam of Genesis 1.26. Did you see what you just learned? You see what you just learned? Genesis 5, verses 1 to 3, took Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27. The creation of Adam is male and female in the image of God and told us that that male and female is none other than Adam and Eve because they're the ones who are the parents of Seth. So according to Genesis 5, verses 1 to 3, Genesis 1, 26 to 27 is referring to the same Adam and Eve of Genesis chapter 2. Right? Is that clear? So want to make sure you're getting it. So how are you going to argue that Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the races, but Genesis 2 is talking about a specific human couple created on the eighth day, different from the races created on the sixth day, when Genesis 5 verses 1 and 3 told you the creation of Adam on the sixth day is the same creation of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2. It's the same creation. Because the Adam of Genesis 1 refers to Adam and Eve of Genesis 2. So it's not two sets of human beings being created on different days. It's the same set of human beings created on the same day in Genesis 1, which Genesis 2 gives us more details. Is that clear or no? Everyone, is it making sense, in other words, before I move on to the next point? There isn't. They assume, Jojo, that since Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3 say God rested on the seventh day, but then Genesis 2, verses 4 to 25 talks about God creating male and female in the garden, that means he must have done it after the seventh day, interrupted his rest, and produced an eight-day creation of male and female and other animals to go along or to live alongside male and female in the garden. But for everyone else following with me, and if I didn't confuse you, do you understand if you read Genesis 1 and 2 in the context of Genesis, specifically in light of Genesis 5, the male and female of Genesis 1, 26, 27, created in the image of God, same male and female created in Genesis 2, that's Adam and Eve, according to Genesis 5, right? So Genesis 5, verses 1 to 3, took Genesis 1, verses 26 to 27, took Genesis 2, verses 4 to 25, and Genesis 4, verse 25, combined them together in identifying Adam and Eve as that Adam, that male and female that was created on the sixth day. The guy's talking about his mother and his prophet. Right there. His mother and his prophet. Throw away. That's why he was thrown away. Everyone with me there? Is it making sense or am I confusing you guys? Are you getting the point? Before I move on. Because I don't want to move on if you're not getting the point. Now let's see if our Lord Jesus Christ assumed that the creation of mankind in Genesis 1 
includes the creation of male and female, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 2. Did our Lord believe that Genesis 1, 26, 27 is speaking of the same human couple that God created in Genesis 2? Let's see if Jesus believed that. Let's go to Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Yeah, but Jojo, I'm trying to teach you how to respond to their objections so they don't get away with murder or trying to claim to know the Hebrew when they don't. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That's Genesis 1, 27, Genesis 5, 2. Jesus just referred to Genesis 1, 27 and Genesis 5, verse 2. But notice now what he's going to quote. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are not more twain, no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus just combined Genesis 1, 27, where Adam was created male and female with Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, which is the chapter speaking of the creation of Adam and Eve becoming one flesh. And he combines those two chapters together and applies that to the creation of the first human couple. You see it? So for Jesus, Adam and Eve of Genesis 2 are the male and female that God created in Genesis 1, 27 and Genesis 5, verse 2. Do you see it? Because he cites Genesis 2, 24 and combines that statement. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He combines that passage with Genesis 1.27, where it says God created male and female. So Jesus identified the male and female of the six-day creation as Adam and Eve who become one flesh. Clear? Everyone getting it or no? So I want to make sure it's sinking in. Okay, now here's some problems with this position that says there was a six-day creation of humans and an eight-day creation of Adam and Eve. Note this view says not all human beings are descended from Adam and Eve. Not all human beings are directly related to Adam and Eve, right? According to this view, you have human races created on the sixth day that are not from Adam and Eve and are not related to Adam and Eve necessarily, right? Now, this poses a problem. Romans 5, 12 to 14. Romans 5, 12 to 15. Here's the problem. No, actually, I heard him say that first and last. Go back and call him. You can call him. His number is there. He'll tell you yes. He talked about Adam and Eve being created on the eighth day. I heard him say that. I'm very certain. But that's what I'm saying. Confirm. Romans 5, 12 to 14. Yep. Romans 5, 12 to 14. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world. It's not about Adam. Sin entered the world through Adam and death by sin. So when he sinned, he brought physical death. So death passed upon all men for all for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was, was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. So even when the law wasn't revealed, there was still sin in the world. Now notice 14, right? Notice 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. Can I ask you guys a question? If there is a separate creation of humans on the sixth day from the creation of Adam and Eve, how did Adam's sin bring death to them when they didn't sin? So if Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and were expelled, the other human beings, races, were not in the garden. They were not tempted by the serpent. So how did they corrupt themselves? Because not every one of them married into Adam's line. So those who didn't marry into Adam's line, how did they die? And why were they destroyed? You want me there? 
You understand the, uh, the problem here? Did it make sense? If you have human races created on the sixth day separately from Adam and Eve, that means these human races are not connected to Adam and Eve. They're not related to Adam and Eve. How did Adam's sin bring death to them when many of them did not intermarry with Adam and Eve's line, were separate from Adam and Eve, and did not fall to the serpent's temptations? So how did they die? Why did they die? Why were they destroyed? You with me there? How do you account for their destruction? Are you going to say, well, because the sons of God came and corrupted their seed, contaminated their gene pool, and so they all had to be destroyed by the flood. But hold on. What about the people who married and had children before the angels corrupted their seed? Because on the sixth day, you would have had people marrying and having children. Those who married, those males and females who married, they didn't get contaminated by the angelic infestation. Why did they die? How did they corrupt themselves? How did they go from immortal to being mortal? You see the problem with this position? Because you're going to have to do a lot of explaining away, a lot of reading into the text. You get my point? You see the problem with positing two different human creations or two different acts of creating human beings, creative acts of, of human beings, a six-day creation of humans and an eight-day? Do you know why Groong, they do this? Because it sounds new, it sounds fascinating, it sounds amazing, and it captures people's attention because people want something new, sensational, mind-blowing to buy into because that makes them feel special as if they have some knowledge, secret knowledge that makes them special and better than others. Right? You get my po point? Because it sounds amazing. It sounds, you know sensational right mind-blowing and then when you're taught it it makes you feel special because you belong to a special group that only knows this information and the rest don't so it makes you feel more spiritual closer to god and better than them it's a type of gnosticism gnosticism an ancient heresy where he she belong to a special group of elite people who have special knowledge about the Bible that no one else has. Right? You get it? Everyone clear? It's a form of Gnosticism, Gnosis, secret knowledge that only the elite have. And you need to go to these teachers to give you that knowledge. And now you're part of this special group that makes you more spiritual, closer to God, and better than the rest. That's all it is. That's all it is. Right? Clear? Elitism, Gnosticism. But you saw why there's a problem with claiming that you have human races created on the sixth day and then Adam and Eve on the eighth day because the sound interpretation of the context of Genesis 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2, will not allow for such an interpretation. Especially when you read Genesis in light of the overall teaching of the Bible, specifically the words of our Lord Jesus. And don't forget the problem. Let me repeat the problem. If these human races are separate from Adam and Eve, then these human races did not corrupt themselves because they did not fall prey to the serpent's temptation. Only Adam and Eve did. They corrupted themselves. They brought death on themselves. Then how did the rest of the human beings die? What do they do to die? What do they do to stop becoming immortal? Exactly, Irene. 
What did they do to become mortal? They were immortal. They say, well, they mixed in with Adam and Eve's seed. Well, wait, many of them didn't. Well, the angelic invasion where the angels corrupted, contaminated the human gene pool. Well, some of them did not have sex with the angels. What about them? What happened to them? Why did they die? How did they die? See the problems? Is it sinking in? Are you seeing the problems with this view? Is it sinking in? And are you seeing the problem with this view? See, si, see, si, senor. So if you take this session and the first session, you'll have ample evidence why these arguments are silly. They have no foundation. They have to distort, pervert the meaning of words and wrench versus out of context. No, Cain is not the physical son of Satan. No, the serpent did not have sex with Eve and get her pregnant. And no, Genesis 1.26 is not speaking of the creation of human races as a different and separate act of creation from Adam and Eve in Genesis 2. No, sir, if you interpret the Bible correctly in context and then allow the New Testament to inform your understanding of the Old Testament, those interpretations are not tenable. They're not plausible. They are perversions of Scripture. Right? Is that clear? But is Cain the seed of Satan in another sense? It's okay, Al. You can then listen to it later. A lot of people believe it's called the serpent seed theory, Daryl Danzinger. The most famous proponent of this view, as far as I know, because he has a huge worldwide following and impact, is Pastor Arnold Murray, who passed away of Shepherd's Chapel. You can, you can go to his YouTube channel and his website, and they still replay his lectures because he would go through every book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, line by line, verse upon verse, for the first half hour, and then the next half hour, answer written questions. And I used to watch him in the late 90s, all, all the way into the 21st century. His son has taken over, Dennis Murray, and he continues to teach. And earlier today, when I refuted the fact that Cain is the seed of the devil, we had two of his followers trying to debate me. Two. And it didn't, they didn't fare too well. Okay? Now, with that said, there is a sense, a sense in which Cain is the child of Satan. Cain is the seed of Satan. But it's not physical seed via sexual intercourse. It's spiritual seed via the seed of sin and evil. Because the Bible talks about the seed of God being planted in our hearts. And if you read what the scriptures teach, when it says the seed of God, it means the word of God, the word of God. And you find that in Jesus' parables, right? When he talks about the soil, like in Luke chapter 8, where a man <clears throat> sowed seed and it fell on four types of soil. And then Jesus explains that the seed is God's word. Sometimes it's, the word of God just falls on the surface. Sometimes it takes root deeply within the person's heart. And in the in the epistle of John, in 1 John, we talk, we, we read, as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and saves me from error in Jesus' name, we read about the seed of God, that God has planted his seed in us, and we're born of his seed. So yes, there is something called the spiritual seed of God and the spiritual seed of the devil. What's the spiritual seed of the devil? The devil inspiring you to sin and disobey God, and in so doing, coming under the influence, control, and possession of the evil one. Right? So it's spiritual, not physical, not sexual. So Cain is the physical son of Adam and Eve, but the spiritual seed of the devil. Why did he become the spiritual seed of the devil? 
because he allowed sin to control him, dominate him, and enslave him. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Let me now show you. Cain is the seed of the devil spiritually. Which view? I don't know what you're talking about, King of Kings. God speaking to Cain. God speaking to Cain. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now he's saying, I'm warning you, Cain. Sin is at the door. It desires to control you, to enslave you. You must conquer it. You must overcome it. You must vanquish it. Right? So how do you become the seed of the devil? Not because Satan had sex physically and got E pregnant physically and she gave birth to the physical son of the devil. No, you become a son of the devil by carrying out, acting upon the desires of the devil, by succumbing to the temptations of the devil, by obeying the devil's will, his command over against God. In that sense, you are a son, a daughter of the devil. Right? Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Yes, evangelist. Is that clear? Everyone get it? So yes, Satan has children, has seed. God has children, has seed. Spiritual, not physical, not sexual. Spiritual. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Exactly, Groong. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but anyway. 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Read with me. He that committeth sin is of the devil. So how do you become the seed of the devil? Did you catch it? Did you read it? How do you become the seed of the devil? What's the sign that you are of the seed of the devil? You sin. You willfully sin. Your life is characterized by sin. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, God's seed, remaineth in you, in him. Don't tell me this is talking about God's physical seed, because God is not a physical being who has physical semen. It's spiritual seed. And what's the spiritual seed? The word of God planted in you that you believe and act upon, resulting, demonstrating you are a child of God. His seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, meaning he does not go on sinning willfully. There's a war against sin, a struggle against sin, and you hate sin and try to overcome it, though you may fail at times, but your lifestyle is not characterized by willful sin and justification of it because you've been changed because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. <clears throat> Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you have <clears throat> received from the beginning. Let's go back. You've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Now notice verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And whereof slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Could the Bible be any more clear, folks? That you are a spiritual offspring of the devil when you carry out the devil's will and desires and take his word over against God's word. So you are the seed of the devil spiritually, not physically, not through sexual procreation. Any more than you are the seed of God through sexual procreation. It is spiritual. So Cain is the offspring of the devil spiritually because he succumbed to sin. He became enslaved to sin, dominated by sin, controlled by sin. He didn't overcome it. Everyone getting it? Everyone getting it? 
Just want to make sure. So, Satan no more has physical offspring than God has physical offspring. God's offspring are spiritual children born of spiritual seed from God, which is the word of God planted in our hearts that's then made alive and bears fruit by the spirit living in us. Similarly, Satan is a spiritual being, though he's capable of doing physical things because remember what I said, spirit creatures were designed in such a way they can assume human form and carry out human functions and activities. They can do that, so can Satan. But in the context of these passages, it's contrasting the spiritual seed of God with the spiritual seed of the devil. The spiritual offspring of God with the spiritual offspring of the devil. Thank you, Steve Turner. Right? So, yes, Cain is the spiritual offspring of the devil. In fact, Cain is the firstborn son of the devil. And anyone of any ethnicity, any nationality, anyone. Hold on a second. I'm getting a call. One second, guys. Sorry. Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. It's me. Yes, go ahead. I was doing a live stream, but it's okay. I told him to walk away. What's going on? It's December 16th. They got me a ticket. So I can go to Sorry, guys, I had to step away. Sorry for stepping away, but this is part of it. Thank God. God is answering your prayers. Just to let you know, the Lord is answering your prayers. He's given me tremendous blessing and favor with the locals here. They love me and they're working with me because this person sounds like it's to be a Christian. So God is hearing you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, now, thank Jesus. Now we need favor for Thursday. Miracles, miracles in Jesus' name. Christmas, Lord. Bless me and my daughters for your glory and a new year to start in an amazing way. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, now, is it making sense? Cain is the spiritual seed of the devil, not the physical seed of the devil. And he's the firstborn son of Satan. Did I make that case clear thus far? Now, if it's clear, let me repeat the point I was trying to make. If you're following with me, let me repeat the point I'm trying to make. Okay. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity. If you are a sinner and slave to sin, you're a child of the devil. You belong to the devil. His seed is in you. And therefore, Cain is your spiritual ancestor. The Bible is not... Not about physical lineage. Physical lineage has an important role to play, especially in the Old Testament, in preparing for the coming of the Messiah. The Bible is more concerned with spiritual lineage, spiritual filial relationships, spiritual parentage. This is why you find the repeated emphasis in the New Testament that a Jew is not one outwardly physically, but one inwardly spiritually. And that's why Jesus said, who are my mother and brothers? Not those who are biologically connected to me, but those who do the will of God. Let's look at those passages to make this case so that we stop the nonsense of assuming that Cain is of the evil one physically through sexual procreation. 
That is not the teaching of the Bible. Let me repeat. You belong to the devil spiritually. You become a child of the devil spiritually by having his seed, his will, his desires implanted within you and you acting on those desires until and unless the spirit sets you free and plants God's seed, which is his word, spiritual seed in your heart and causes you to be born above. Yes, Irene, you're a spiritual Jew. I'm going to prove it to you. Exactly, Gron. The Bible is not the book of porn called the Quran. But let me prove it to you. You guys ready for proof? Are you ready for proof? Mark 3, 31 to 35. Mark 3, 31 to 35. Watch here. Let me give you the proof. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, said unto him, sent unto him, calling him, and the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. How do you become the brother of Christ, the mother of Christ, the sister of Christ? Doing the will of God. It's spiritual, not physical. Right? Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 21. This is going to be a little shorter than the other one. But Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Yeah, freedom of Christ, we're going to get there. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. By faith in Christ Jesus. Pay attention. Folks, you got to pay attention. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, united to Christ, one with Christ in the Spirit, have put on Christ. Now notice, there's neither ethnic Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Bam, it's right there. If you belong to Christ spiritually, born of the Spirit, made one with Christ spiritually, and Christ is your head, you then become a seed and offspring of Abraham, even though you may be Mexican, even though you may be African, even though you may be Arab, even though you may be British. If you're born of the Spirit, one with Christ, you are a spiritual Israelite, a spiritual Jew, and Abraham is your spiritual father. Right? Romans 2, 26 to 29. Romans 2, 26 to 29. Yahuda means to praise, right? Okay, Romans 2, 26 to 29. Guys, read with me. Read. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, meaning the Gentile who's not physically circumcised, keep the righteousness of the law, the requirements of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Meaning, if he's a physical Gentile who's not physically circumcised but does what is right, won't God consider him as if he has been circumcised? And now notice what he says to the Jew who is circumcised. Notice 27. Pay attention, folks. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, Judge you will not will not that Gentile who does what is right, though he's not physically circumcised, judge you, Jew, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress law, though you are physically circumcised, but you break the law. So who's better in the sight of God? That Gentile who's not physically circumcised, but does what is right and fears God, or you, Jew, physically circumcised, but break the law. Now notice 28, 29. Pay attention. 28, 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, ethnically, physically. That doesn't matter to God. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. What is true Jew and true circumcision? But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Clear? Making sense? So do you see what the Bible is teaching is your spiritual paternity 
your spiritual lineage. It's who do you belong to spiritually? Satan doesn't sire children physically, sexually. He sires them spiritually by having them do his word, carrying out his will, his desires, enslaving them to sin and to his control. That's how he has children spiritually. Similarly, God is a spiritual being. He does not sire children physically through sexual procreation. He produces spiritual children by the spiritual seed, which is the word planted in our hearts by the spirit and the spirit making our hearts alive to respond to that word, believe in it and making us one with Christ. And when we're one with Christ in the spirit, becoming his spiritual body, the church, we are the children of God who belong to Christ and therefore children of, of Abraham. Spiritual Israelites, the true Israelites. Making sense? Sinking in? Razo, don't ask me that again. Stop asking me over and over again. Okay. So if you're an ethnic Jew... If you're an ethnic Jew, but you disobey God, break the law, and reject Christ, you are of the devil, and your true father is Cain. Let me show you that. Let's go to Matthew 23, 32, 33. Pay attention. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. And then we'll do a part three on Cain being a physical son of Satan. Matthew 23, 32 to 33. Look what Jesus says to the ethnic Jews, king of kings, everyone, and not to all Jews, to the physical Jews who reject them. The physical Jews who reject them, notice what he says. You fill up then the measure of your fathers. What does he mean here? There's a limit to how much sin God will tolerate. So he waits generation after generation until that particular group of people reach the limit of sin that God will tolerate, and then he turns his attention to destroy them. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, you are the generation. You Jews are that generation that will reach the limit of sin started by your fathers that God will tolerate and say enough is enough and now destroy you righteously. You understand what he's saying? Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can he escape the damnation of hell? Okay, did you understand what he just said? Your fathers started sinning. And you're following in the pattern of your fathers, and you keep continuing in their pattern of sinning, and you'll be that generation that reaches the limit of how much sin God will tolerate, and then you're going to be destroyed. You understand what he's saying here? If anyone's confused, put a two. Ron Hare, don't, why are you changing the subject, dude? You know better to change the subject. See, it's, uh, you want me to block you, man? I'm talking about someone else, and now you're talking about someone else. Why are you here if you're not listening? Okay. Matthew 23, 32, because I want you to catch it one more time. Speaking to the physical Jews. Matthew 23, 32. One more time. Pay attention. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. Who are their fathers? Guys, pay attention. He's talking to physical Jews. Who are the father of these physical Jews who are unbelievers and rejecting Christ? Let's read 35 and 36. Let's see if you catch it. 35 and 36. You got to pay attention here because we're going to end it with a bang. We're going to end it here. Pay attention. Let's see if you catch it. Matthew 23, 35, 36. That upon you, notice, you, you Jews, may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel Unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Notice what he said. Your father started sinning, and you are now that generation that continue in the pattern of your fathers in adding sin to sin. But now you'll be that generation that reaches the full limit of sin that God will tolerate, and you'll be destroyed. And all their sins will fall upon you. All the sins of your fathers, starting with the first sin, the murder of Abel. So your father killed Abel. That's the first sin. And then everyone after that of your ancestors, your fathers, 
continued sinning upon sinning, murdering even the servants of God, and will fall on you. Murdering the servants of God, and it will fall on you. The first sin committed by your father was the murder of Abel. And then every other generation after that, every other father, ancestor of yours after that, continued in that pattern of sin, murdering the righteous servants of God. But I guess you didn't catch it. He's talking to the physical Jews. But Abel was killed by Cain. How then are the Jews responsible for the murder of Abel? Why are they blamed? And why do they share in the guilt of Cain's murder when Cain wasn't their physical ancestor and Cain's line was wiped out in the flood? Why is Cain listed as one of their fathers whose sin they share in, the sin of murdering Abel? When Cain wasn't their physical ancestor and Cain's physical line died out in the flood. What's the answer? Come on. Because though Cain is not their spiritual father, and you guys got it, he's their spiritual ancestor. So what is Jesus saying? You may think you're Jews, and though you're Jews physically, you're not truly Jewish spiritually. You spiritually are of the seed of Cain who belong to Satan. So you too are the children of the devil, like your spiritual ancestor Cain. Wow. Exactly, Daryl. So you understand? Your ethnicity means nothing. Ethnically, you can be a Jew or a Swa African and belong to the devil. Ethnically, you can be a Jew or an African and belong to God. Ethnicity, physicality, color has nothing to do with it. Now, Matthew 20, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, 33, one more time. Matthew 23, 33, one more time. Yep, John 8, 44, exactly, Raz. But guys, pay attention to this, Riaz. You didn't catch it. Speaking to the physical Jews who rejected him, ye serpents, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can he escape the damnation of hell? So you are serpents, you are vipers. Genesis 3, 14 to 15. Genesis 3, verses 14 to 15. Thank you, first and last. Genesis 3, 14 to 15. What does eschatology got to do with my discussion right now? Genesis 3, 14 and 15. And Jehovah God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon <clears throat> thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between you, serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed, your seed, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus just said to the physical Jews, you are the brood of vipers, you are serpents, you are the seed of the serpent, and you're trying to kill me, the seed of the woman. I am the seed of the woman, truly, because Jesus was given birth by a woman who was a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, apart from sexual intercourse. His blessed mother conceived and gave birth to him as a virgin, no sexual intercourse by the Spirit. So here truly was the seed of the woman. The seed who came from a woman only, being opposed by the seed of the serpent. They were serpents who were trying to kill him. John 8, 44. And then we're done. John 8, 44. It means he'll suffer a mortal wound because when a poisonous serpent bites you, you die. And Jesus suffered a mortal wound when he was crucified on the cross and he died. But then he rose victorious. John 8, verse 44. Jesus speaking to the Jews again. To the Jews again. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. This is why you belong to Satan, because you desire to carry out his will, his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning just like Cain, his son, and abode not in the truth, 
because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Bam. I hope you learned a lot in this session and in the previous session. So let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Re-listen to this session and listen or re-listen to the previous session today because I just did two parts on whether Cain is the physical son of Satan, thoroughly refuting this false doctrine of serpent seed theory by the sound interpretation of the Bible in its context by the grace of God's spirit, all glory to the triune God for anything good we do. Re-listen to these sessions, understand the arguments, pass them on, hit the like button, subscribe. Lord Jesus willing, I'll try to be on tomorrow if the Lord wills. Pray for a miraculous deliverance this Thursday. Jesus brings my children into my life. Pray the Lord helps me to keep this weight off, keep losing weight, get healthier and holier and more in love with the Lord, more wisdom, more knowledge to teach you to go into greater depth and for the provision to get my own place, you know, be planted on my feet and not to be burned on anyone and pray for all the people who are helping me now. My brother, I'm at his home. Pray God bless him and his family. Child of God who lets me use his home and keep praying for a miracle. Remember, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. Cover us, our loved ones, my daughters, by your blood and seal us by your spirit forever and ever. Save us from sin, Satan and his children, and from our own flesh. In Jesus' name. Father, Son, and Spirit, we love you. In Jesus' name. See you guys, guys tomorrow, God willing.